So how did you get into translation? <laughs> uh, well, actually, I didn't set out to become a translator. Hey guys, welcome back to the Kodakara Podcast. This week we talked to Marie Ida, who is a Japanese-English interpreter. You might have seen her before on the Late Night Show or the Ellen Show, where she interpreted for Marie Kondo. And in this episode, we get a close look behind what it's like being a translator and what it takes to become one. Like always, we have bonus clips on Patreon. And if you're watching this on YouTube, we would really appreciate it if you can give us a like and subscribe. Hope you guys enjoy the podcast. Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome back to the Korekara Podcast. My name is Raza, and I'm joined by my co-host, Eric. We talk to people of all types of backgrounds about their lives in Japan, studying Japanese, or even tips and tricks on how to learn the language. This week, we're joined by a very special guest in Marie. Yes, so Marie is a Japanese-English interpreter uh, based in the United States. And I first saw her on the late night show with Stephen Colbert, where she was an interpreter for Marie Kondo. And she's the, Marie Kondo is the author of the best-selling book, Spark Joy. And you also see Marie on Jimmy Kimmel's show, as well as on Marie Kondo's new Netflix show. And I was really impressed with how fast and efficient she was able to translate. And as somebody who has been studying Japanese, I was really curious to talk to her and learn more about what it's like to be a professional interpreter at the highest level and what some of our uh, achievements are and what she's working on today. But before we get into that, can you give us a quick background of who you are and where you're at today? Hi, uh, thank you so much for having me on. My name is Marie Ida, and I'm a translator and writer. Um, I'm currently based in Los Angeles. So you're, you're actually bilingual from childhood, right? How were you raised to be bilingual? Sure. Um, I was born in Tokyo, Japan, um, but it was my uh, father's work that first took me to the United States. He was actually studying um, to get his MBA at um, MIT, so that's Boston, Massachusetts, is where he moved the family and basically that's how my life going back and forth like a ping pong between the US and Japan started so yeah my my being bilingual is very much uh, a product of that upbringing so when you went to like um like Japan for example you just did you just go to local school or were you sent to international yes school? so the first time I went to uh, I moved to the states I just I had just finished elementary school first grade and then um, I did. I continued on in the States um, until middle school. And then I finished middle school in Japan and did a little bit of high school in Japan. Then I moved back to the States again and finished high school there. And I went to college um, in the States, so back and forth a lot. And I always went to local schools, um, never international schools or anything like that oh. when I went back to Japan, which nice. was both, wow. both tough and <laughs> interesting. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I can imagine like being just going back and forth between two countries, like personally, like grow- growing up in one spot, I can't even imagine going back and forth between two def- different countries. But mm-hmm. I-, I guess, um, like you mentioned, even though you're raised bilingual, do you ever feel like there is maybe a gap between your English and your Japanese after kind of going back and forth so much? Or was it non-existent? Oh, sure. I mean, I I always feel like I have a gap. Like, even now, I feel like I still do. Um, I I, I feel like I'm constantly learning Japanese and English. It's 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 like a never ending thing. Um, Uh So, yeah, I don't I don't think do you do you ever perfect a language? Like, what's the end point? Right. I just always feel right that it's it's something that you, you both have to like work so hard to keep up. You know, if, if you focus on just one language, like the other one will falter and so on. So, mm-hmm. yeah, that, that's how I feel. <laughs> I guess besides like a, a language gap, was there a, like a cultural gap? Like maybe was it easier to make friends in one country versus another? Sure. Um, well, the thing about my parents or was that whenever I went back to Japan, they always assumed that I was never going to go back to the States ever again. So that's why I think they always enrolled me back into like a Japanese local school which is great but I had never been exposed to like wearing a uniform and going to school and I didn't really know what was like in my culture and all that so yeah it was quite tough to to make friends at first I mean I think a lot of my classmates in Japan thought I was very strange that I, I spoke English so well but um luckily 
when I was in middle school and high school, I went to an all girls school. So, and that was great. The energy there, it was a lot of like strong women and <laughs> strong young women and all that. And it was quite a liberal culture. So yeah, I, I found my way eventually. Nice. So I guess now is, was, is there like a language that's maybe more comfortable to you? Yeah. Um, I, this is, a, I think, a very interesting question because I think a lot of people um, who are listening to the show will probably uh, agree with me that when you speak more than one language, I think depending on what language you're speaking, like your vocal register or like your tone kind of changes, mm-hmm. right? Like for me, when right. I'm when I'm speaking English, like my my just like voice gets a lot lower, and like deeper, and I think uh-huh. it's because English just allows me to have that sort of like speak with a little more confidence and like, Mm. I don't know, authority. And that's very empowering for me, depending on the situation. Like it gives me like a boost of confidence to be speaking in English and being having more of an assertive personality. But at the same time, I'm also very comfortable when I speak Japanese because what Japanese language allows you to do is to sort of like keep a distance from people. It's like, it gives you like an invisible cushion you know, between you and other people. And I, and I like uh-huh. that too. So it really depends on the situation for me. <laughs> I does, see. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, it's also kind of interesting. Um, this is kind of a, a different example, but when like Eric and I have been to Japan, mm-hmm. it's, um, we, we, we kind of also sometimes tend to take advantage of the opposite of that in, in case like let's say we're in a very maybe uncomfortable spot there's something called the gaijin pass that right, we can right. let's, <laughs> sometimes sure. take advantage of <laughs> yeah but absolutely yeah. and in japan like there's a reason why like that that's how kegel functions right yeah. like you kind of want right. to keep a certain distance from your boss or whatever <laughs> kind of you don't have to like get so close to them <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's it's very interesting how that works, but in America, like there's no such thing as a kegel, not really. So, I guess you get to have more of an, infor- an informal conversation with everyone at work, for instance. So that's that's always fascinated me. Yeah, yeah. Mm. I mean, it's always great not having to learn kegel too in in English. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I guess you can, yeah, yeah, like learn like British English. Or something and <laughs> get the accent down sound a little more polite. Like only with your boss, you speak British English. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I, I'd love to it. try that someday. I wanna. I wonder how that would go. <laughs> yeah, I, I have an interpreter friend. Um, he's Japanese, but he has like the most perfect British accent because that's where he grew up. And uh-huh. yeah, and he just sounds so much better than I do <laughs> like when he were speaking in English. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, man. I mean, it, it's always interesting. Like, we, we've seen some people, too, who ha- were in the same... Actually, there's one person that we saw on YouTube. This guy pretty much um, grew up in Japan, but mm-hmm. he went to... He first went to the States, so he got first got, like, a, an American accent, but then he went and lived in Europe, so then he got sort of, like, a British accent, and right. then he went to... Australia. So now his accent's kind of like a big jumble between the three, and it just constantly switches depending on who he's talking to. Wow, that's that's fascinating. Yeah, and I and I wonder like how that you know shapes his personality too, right? Like that's that's what I right. was trying to say about like the vo- the vocal register and stuff. I don't know. I think yeah, yeah, language and dialect and all that like really influence how you present yourself. I think definitely, mm. definitely. Yeah, I'm, I'll, I'll try working on my British accent <laughs> this podcast, maybe. <laughs> see, see how, see how I change there. But now, now I guess kind of shifting over to translation. <laughs> oh, Eric's loving. I'm just like Eric really wants me to. <laughs> you actually do that. Oh, he, he really wants me to go into the the British accent for the next podcast. Yeah. No, just like the next All question right. you should. I go for it. I mean, I'm sure it's better than mine. <laughs> oh, you want me to do the next question? <laughs> oh man, I feel like I'm gonna offend some people now. <laughs> you know, I'll I'll take a stab at it. If if it goes well, it goes well. If it doesn't, maybe I'll just like have a really bad voiceover or something and make it very obvious that it was edited out. <laughs> Don't worry. 
So how did you get into translation? Uh, well, actually, I didn't set out to become a translator or interpreter. <laughs> that was really bad. <laughs> Um, oh yeah, really? Yeah. Uh, should we just do the rest of this podcast in a British accent? Uh, no, I don't think so. That would be. Uh. <laughs> okay. So um, yeah, like I was saying, I didn't set out to become a translator or interpreter. Um, I I think I always this is where I am in my life right now because I always just uh, worked hard at the opportunities that were presented to me at the time. And uh -huh. so how, how did I get into translation? Um, it's kind of a long story, so I'll try to be as succinct as possible. So after graduating from um, NYU, uh, I was in New York and I wasn't really sure um, what I wanted to do, but language was always um, in my arsenal. So I, I was vaguely interested in interpreting and I, was, I, and I felt pretty confident that that's something that I could do. So a friend of a friend knew a professional interpreter, so I reached out to her, and she was gracious enough to kind of take uh, take me out for lunch one day and hear me out. And I was just, you know, pitching her an idea of being an interpreter. And she she listened to, to me say my piece, and at the end of our conversation, she was like, okay, so you want to get be an interpreter? She's like, I would go back to Japan, is what she told me. <laughs> and I was like, and that was not my plan at the time. And I was like, I was like, well, I don't need to go to Japan. I'm Japanese. I speak Japanese. And she's like, no, you don't. You just, you, you speak English and you don't know any, anything or like anywhere close to what you should be at the level of Japanese. And, you know, a lot of things influenced my next decision, but her, what she said to me really stuck with me. And I eventually did go back to Japan. Um, and in Japan, I took various odd jobs. I worked for a magazine called Metropolis, which was a Japan's like English language ma magazine, um, for like foreigners and tourists and so on. And I was a writer there and, and other jobs that I had was, um, I worked for a film production company that produced a lot of not only Japanese, but American films as well. And I was very lucky because I think when you go from a Western world to, joining a corporate culture in Japan, there's a lot of culture clashes, but I was very fortunate to work under a very, um, you know, amazing female boss. And she was a very inspiring figure for me. And, but I was just her assistant. But, um, one of the films that she produced was, uh, do you guys know Ethan Hawke, the actor? Yeah. 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 So he had directed a film called the hottest state and, um, with the company that I was working with. So he came to Japan to promote the film. And obviously we were doing this thing called a press junket, which is basically the Hollywood actor is in like a beautiful suite of a hotel and like the members of the media just come one by one to ask him questions. Right. And obviously we needed an interpreter and I was just an assistant. So I'm not really sure what happened, but the first interpreter that they hired for him didn't work out. And suddenly my boss was without an interpreter. And so they were kind of in a bind. And she turns to me and says, like, oh, you speak English. You should be interpreting. So <laughs> my first brush with real inter being a real interpreter was with, like, an A-list Hollywood actor. <laughs> and I had oh, wow. no idea what happened. So they were just kind of, like, biding time until they could find a real interpreter. So I, I, I just had to, yeah, step in for the moment. And right. I'm sure it, w it went terribly. I have like no memory of it because I pro I'm probably like traumatized. <laughs> <laughs> but um, that, but but afterwards, the real pro uh, professional interpreter showed up, and I was able to look at her work closely, and I was mesmerized, and I just saw how well, how eloquent she was, her word choices, and like just how well she facilitated that communication between both parties. Um, it was just amazing to see. And from there, I was like, oh, well, this is something that I'd like to get better at. <laughs> wow. Way, way to take an advantage of an opportunity. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, wow. From there, um, I, afterwards, I wanted to get better interpreting. So basically what I did was just started cold calling a lot of, I, I called a lot of like art and culture magazines in Tokyo. And I asked them like, oh, I can speak English. Do you need an interpreter? And not everyone returned my calls or emails, but some editors took, uh, said, sure. 
you know, and these are Japanese magazines who are constantly having, you know, foreign artists that they needed to interview. So they took me along and that's how I kind of gained experience, I guess. I see. I see. And I I know you also had um, experience going and interpreting for various um, groups. Mm -hmm. So I guess like when you were like interpreting for all these groups, how was that kind of after you got the experience in Japan and kind of went back to America? I guess how was the... I see it. So I I guess um, after gaining all the experience in Japan, how was how how did you transition back to america um well this was after um i only started interpreting for those organizations after i graduated from columbia for for grad school so by then i felt a little more confident with my language abilities and it's just that new york city is basically probably the best city if you are looking for top rate interpreters you know, in the UN or the arts or finance or what have you. So it was very natural and easy for me to find mentors. And I would shadow a lot of them. That's how I um, began. But these, you know, cultural organizations, um, one of them was called Japan Society, which is like a nonprofit organization in New York that sort of facilitates the exchange of cultures between U.S. and Japan. They were just so amazing to give me so, so much incredible experience. And just kind of take a chance on me because they they had a lot of incredible like world renowned guests from Japan. So, and it, these are all live on stage interpreting. So basically, if I made a mistake, the audience would know. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that that was probably uh, a tough but good experience to have. Yeah, high pressure situations. Mm-hmm, absolutely. <laughs> So I, I guess when you did go back to Colombia for your master's, at this point you knew that you wanted to be in translation, right? Yeah, not exactly, but I, it was always my interest. Yeah, I, I, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. Like I sound like a totally unmotivated person. I was like, oh, it's just like something I fall into. But <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, I'm the kind of person that just like, oh, you know, whenever an opportunity presents itself to me, I'll like work hard at it, but. Maybe I, uh-huh. I, I should start seeking them out more. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, it, it sounds to me you're seeking them out pretty well, though. You're cold calling everyone yeah, in Japan. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, and I, I recommend doing that because I think, you know, passion goes a long way, especially when you're young. So, right, right. Which, which I no longer am, but... <laughs> 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 So how did you actually study interpretation? Like you talked about shadowing, but did you go through like mm-hmm. formal training as well? Well, um, well, see, and this is something that I can, um, you don't have to do in person. Like nowadays there's so many, you can just go on YouTube and look at like interview sessions with artists where there are interpreters present. And I just went to those events where my, me- where my mentors were interpreting and I would just look at their body language, the way they, you know, conducted themselves um, during those situations. Mm-hmm. So it was just basically a lot of um, studying um, my mentors and questioning them and asking them how to take notes and so on. Yeah, so that's basically how I... And they were very open about um, teaching me as well. They said, like, just watch TV and, like, you know, practice by yourself, like, in- interpreting live and all that. Right. Um, you speak in a lot about your mentors. Mm-hmm. So did you have maybe one specific piece of advice you have you got from them that really drove you a long way in your career? Yeah, um, one mess, one advice that always stuck with me was um, one of them told me to always be read, be reading. And she said, read everything, just books, anything you can get your hands on in both Japanese and, and English, like always be reading and when there's a word you don't understand you should be looking it up all the time because the more like words you have in your toolbox the better right when you're interpreting so that's something that um that i try to practice even today (laughs) i see i I mean uh, one thing you also mentioned before that also kind of surprised me just now was um the use of body language and interpreting because when you think about interpreting especially for me just now it's always about like word usage and really bridging the gap between the Mm -hmm. two parties but like body language and gestures isn't something you really think about first right so I guess 
what's really the importance of it and how how does it go a long way? Well, I think that came pretty naturally to me um, and I understood how important um, those things are because I've been, I was doing so much live interpretation and a lot of um, Q&A sessions with live audiences. And, you know, I, I never wanted to drop the energy that the artist, the speaker was exuding. That was so important to me. And right. it's kind of a joke. I always call myself like a party interpreter because like <laughs> you can't kill the mood, you know, and yeah, it, it's obviously um accuracy is like of the most utmost importance but at the same time like you kind of want to convey the spirit of the speaker as much as possible to the audience so yeah yeah i definitely got that when i've seen you um translate in front of live audiences on youtube (laughs) (laughs) honestly it's amazing I, i i can't even begin to understand how you it's it's so crazy to me how quickly you do it and how oh. no energy is lost it's it really is amazing thank you um i just wanted to add that it wasn't always like easy and i made a lot of mistakes it, you know when i started um and uh-huh. i always kept um like a machigaya noto which is like mistake books like and uh-huh. i hate revisiting those notebooks because I remember every word that I couldn't interpret and how embarrassing that was because they were all live and New York Uh city audiences are smart, right? Some of, some of the people in the audience would speak better Japanese or better English than I do. So sometimes if I get stuck or if I was slow, like they would shout out, shout out, you know, like like, that's not what he means or something like that. So it, it was tough. Um, but you just, you just, you know, you, you need that experience of making mistakes and that that's the only way to get better. Right. And, and that sort of embarrassment kind of like forces you to never make the same mistake again. (laughs) Yeah. Wow. That's like completely different from how I kind of envisioned gaining experience, especially, I guess you were in New York too, but Mm -hmm. it it kind of reminds me of like a a stand up comedy and you tell like a bad joke and everyone's like, I'll get off the stage. Absolutely. Um, I don't know if I'm like, yeah. Okay. I I don't know like how old you guys are. So like, I don't know how I like our age difference, but like, you know, that eight mile song by Eminem. Yeah. yeah like, you know yeah, how yeah. it goes? Like he's like getting himself like worked up to do like a rap battle. Like that's mm-hmm. how I feel whenever I interpret like, Oh, like <laughs> if you miss this moment, like you're, it's never coming back. And like, <laughs> you're back to, like that. Yeah. I felt that, you know? <laughs> so um, I'm glad. Palms are weak. I'm glad. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you, you know what I'm talking about. Um, but that's what yeah. you have to do when you didn't like formally learn interpreting. You know, that's that's the only way I think. Right. W- was there ever a situation where you didn't understand like a a word and you didn't know how to translate it? Sure, but what happens in that situation is that because you don't have like a direct word for it, you just end mm-hmm. up explaining in a very roundabout way which takes a lot of time. So it's never efficient. So you always find a way, but it, it's not the best way. Yeah, I see. So would you say it's another main principle of translating being very efficient and concise with your words to get the say the idea through as mm-hmm. little words as possible, or maybe like as little words as possible while conveying like the same motion, maybe? Well, Yes, but it's different with um, interpretation, which is oral, like, you know, but in, it's an entirely different um, thing when it's translation with the written word. So uh-huh. when you're doing written translation, it's not it's right. always one to one correlation, right? If that makes right, sense. Right. But with interpretation, yes, speed is just as important as accuracy. Um, so you, you just I- take take what comes to you and hope that it's the best. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, w- one thing I was also wondering was um, when we found out that we'd get the opportunity to interview you was, 
would, would would you did you ever feel nervous going up on these TV shows? But now hearing that you've gotten all this like experience before, where you're already live on stage, it, it makes it makes a lot more sense. But did did it ever get to you when you were going on these TV shows, mm-hmm. despite your previous experience, that it, would would you still get nervous going on? Well, a lot of these TV experiences was for promoting Marie Kondo's show, so I always knew that, and I and I. And it's always the same, but with interpreting, you got to keep your ego in check, right? It's not about you. You're there to do provide a service, and it's right. the speaker's, you know, opportunity to shine. Like you're there because of them. So I always have, and that that kind of helped me to think like, oh, nobody's paying attention to me. I'm like a microphone. I just need to do a job, and nobody's looking at me. And when you're successful as an interpreter. Nobody notices you, right? That connection right. between the speaker and the audience is seamless. So right. thinking that really helped me. I see. Yeah. Wow. That's a great way to think about it. Wow. <laughs> and I guess also now speaking to Marie Kondo. So, I mean, real real quick before we get into that. Um, so how, how's your fo- uh, your clothes folding skills now after spending oh all that time God. with Marie Kondo? <laughs> so, you know, I'm far from like perfecting interpreting, but I think I can say that I'm one of those rare interpreters who have to like fold clothes perfectly in addition while interpreting. So, like, <laughs> I don't know if I can fit that in my resume, but yeah, I, I, I got a lot of practice and I learned from the best. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely put that on your resume. Most yeah. unique job in the world. Right yeah. There. <laughs> interpreting while folding clothes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I got to personally work on my clothes folding skills. After after seeing Marie Kondo out there, I'm yeah. very far behind, to, <laughs> to say the least. But I'll, I'll get there. I'll get there. <laughs> but Definitely. yeah, so again, going back to Marie Kondo. So how, how exactly did you end up finding the opportunity with her and how did you end up meeting? Yeah, um, well, Marie's book, first book, The Life-Changing Magic of Tiding Up, I think it was published like six years ago in the States side. And I started right. w- working with her around like four years ago when she was promoting the book. And again, uh-huh. she came to New York to do to do like a lecture at Japan Society that I spoke about. And she, uh, yeah, her people called me, said they were looking for an interpreter. So that that's how I met her. And when she um, was doing the show, she was, I, I think, we. we we had a pretty good connection starting off, so I think she picked me to do the show as well. I see, I see. Mm-hmm. And, and I guess, like, to how you got discovered, so is there, like, a is there like a network of interpreters that, like, that you kind of, like, you're a place to put yourself out or maybe put your resume for, like, getting these opportunities? Or yeah. is it, like, word, to, word of mouth? For me, um, working in New York City was primarily word of mouth. Um, I see. yeah, but I, I, di- I did have a network of other interpreters who, you know, when they couldn't do a job, they would call me out to stand in. And so I, I did have that community, which I'm, I was very fortunate to have. Well, mm-hmm. I mean, that's really cool. So yeah. everyone always got each other's back and whenever someone didn't have a job kind of came through for the other. Yeah. Um, and I think it's important for interpreters to like support each other because it's not like there's like a union or anything when we're all freelance and like uh-huh. even fighting for like a fair wage is something it's better done together. So, yeah. Oh, wow. Mm. I, I guess going back to Marie's opportunity, though, I, I guess what was maybe one of the main things you kind of learned through the opportunity you got with her because I guess you kind of from what you mentioned each experience you've had you've gained new ex- not only like experience but something to I guess add to your arsenal as mm-hmm. well as maybe like mentors that kind of like bring you up along so I, I guess what was maybe one of the main things that you took away from Marie Kondo's um, experience I think well this is you know a testament to Marie Kondo's power and presence and what she accomplished but just the fact that a show like that is possible in the states was amazing to see like i don't think you see a a lot of shows with an interpreter present and it it was just very inspiring for me to see like a fellow japanese woman 
be a host of her mm. own show in the States. And yeah. just to, and, and I got a lot of help from, we had a brilliant um, editors who were also, who also speak, spoke Japanese and understood Japanese. So he knew how to edit the show in a way that is easy to watch for the American audience. And I think we all prove that you can have a show with an interpreter or someone who doesn't speak English. And yeah, it was, I was very proud to be a part of that so that we can, yeah. you know, hopefully have more shows with diverse voices and backgrounds. Yeah, mm -hmm. really paving the way. I, I can't wait for more shows to continue in your footsteps <laughs> over here. And yeah. I mean, also, a lot of credit goes to you for really making it possible, too, because, I mean, you need to have a good interpreter to be able to make that happen. So mm -hmm. really, really glad to have seen you on there. And I mean, seeing a couple episodes myself, it's you're, you're mind blowing, to say uh, the least. Thank you. Appreciate that. Very kind. <laughs> And I, I guess, so, of course, Marie Kondo is probably one of the, the biggest names you've interpreted for. But I guess in terms of your job, in terms of, like, choosing who to work for, like you mentioned, you're freelance. How, how would you say you go about maybe picking your clients? Oh, uh, well, I, I would advise that if you're starting out, I, I certainly when I was starting out, I never turned down anyone just because uh -huh. I was just trying to get experience. <clears throat> but um, yeah. Well, nowadays I, I try to um, pick clients who are in the same sort of field as me, and I most I feel I'm most proficient in like the arts and books and films and things like that. So, yeah, I, I try to ha have like a little, my own little niche. <laughs> I see, I mm -hmm. see. Because the terminology can get pretty difficult, right? right. Like. It's one thing right. to interpret for a filmmaker one day, but then like a sushi chef the next time. It's like a completely different terminology. <laughs> so, yeah, it, it, it's I mean, if, if you're the type of person that can do everything, that's awesome. But it also helps to have like an area of expertise. Yeah, I guess like what is um, what would you say is like a, the most difficult part of being a, a translator? Like, are there language specific things? Um. Well, you know, I was, I'm currently translating like a fictional book right now with um, another translator. And there's a word that kept coming back in this book, uh, coming up in this book, which is like bakuzento, which means like vague or ambig ambiguous. And like, uh -huh. there's so much about the Japanese language that's vague. And I always grapple with like, how do you translate so that it's not like a chore for the American readers? to read but mm -hmm. but not like sacrifice what the Japanese text is trying to convey through that ambiguity and it, it's definitely like not, not one to one direct translation I mean like what what is a direct translation right and I'm right. always striving to create the same effect that I get when I'm reading the original text through translation so yeah like I think I read um Norwegian Wood in both mm -hmm. I, I read it in like both English and Japanese but in Japanese it's like two volumes of 300 pages each and in English it's just like right. 200 pages so I'm like how yeah. much is lost here right right <laughs> right but um one of the translators that I admire um she's a Japanese translator um Sachiko Kishimoto um she said like somewhere I read that you should always aim for a direct translation but that doesn't mean you adhere to exactly what is written on the page, right? It's like, it's never yeah. as simple as looking for an exact match. <laughs> so, yeah, that, that, those are some of the things I think about while translating. Do you feel like technology will ever get to a point where um, translation is not needed to be done by humans? Like, would translation by computers be good enough? Um. Yeah, well, I mean, I think for specific fields that might be possible, like emails and things like that, I'm sure it's it's possible. But like, like I said, with human to human like communication, like there's so much that's lost, you know, when it's not done by another person. Right? Like, I don't know. But then I I got really sad when I went to Japan last time and I saw like this AI translator thing and it was like oh mm. god that that robot's gonna replace me soon <laughs> <laughs> so, but um, I, I i think we're ways away from that so hopefully 
by the time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Should be okay for now. Yeah, it, it was the robot's not going to replace you if you if we give it a one star review. Like we got <laughs> Good to know. Yeah, I mean, just from um, knowing both Japanese and English, though, it's very like like you mentioned, so much gets lost. And like, whenever like you listen to Japanese specifically, there's words and phrases that have take on a completely different meaning that you it's so hard to put into mm. words into English. So like you were mentioning that you go for a direct translation to, mm. I guess, not necessarily what's exactly on the page. So I guess like factoring that Japanese like has some own like like unique um, attributes that kind of go towards it. How do you kind of take that into consideration when you try to find like English words and phrases to kind of go and have the same vibe and the same feel to like readers when they read it in English. Mm. I try to pay attention to when I read the original text or even when I'm listening to the speaker, like what kind of image does it evoke in my head and how can I uh-huh. recreate that image with English? Mm. So, I see. yeah. So it's, it's like very important if you're translating like a book that hopefully if you're translating into English, the reader will get the same effects that you got when you're reading Japanese, you know? I see, so, I see. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's super interesting to hear in terms of, like, it's kind of like reverse engineering what's yeah. kind of the end product, right? Exactly, but, you know, it's not like a science, I don't think. So I think that's why it's so important for there to be various translations of the same book. I, I think that's totally needed and right. fine to have because everybody reads text in different ways like you know we may be reading the same text but what what it gets created in my mind might be totally different than you guys is right so right, right yeah so i think it's great that so many of your listeners are learning a new language and mm-hmm. you know giving a go at interpreting and translating well so one thing i wanted to ask was um so i i don't know if you've ever seen this movie kill bill but in, in yeah, the movie sure. there's like there's a scene where uh, basically like this Yakuza boss, she's like a Japanese American and her translator, mm-hmm. her interpreter is like a uh, American woman. And I thought, I thought that was really cool. So I want to ask like, did you uh, ever meet any like interpreters who weren't actually raised to be bilingual? Yeah. Well, um, you know, I'm, I'm translating this book called Lady Joker right now. It's going to be published this April. And my code translator, um, she has so much more experience than I do. Her name is, um, Alison Martin Powell, and um, she's done. She's translated so many amazing Japanese books, and she's completely like she studied in university and graduate school and so on. But she didn't grow up in a bilingual oh. um, culture or any, a, a bilingual environment or anything. So yeah, I think some of the most impressive people I've met who are you know multilinguists are self-taught. So <laughs> yeah, oh, wow. I think that's what you know. The first person that I mentioned when I first wanted to be an interpreter and she told me to go back to Japan like when you Mm. grow up in a bilingual experience you just feel like by default you can interpret but it takes so much more dedication than that and self-taught people have that passion and dedication so (laughs) wow yeah I mean I, I I it's really it's really powerful to hear too I mean being able to kind of pick it up like towards like later in life too because you always have that sort of stigma of like oh you can't learn a language unless you're a kid you always Uh, hear that here and there and when you see people go in picking it up in like college graduate school and then transforming that into a full-time career and being really good at it you know it's it's really amazing to see all the hard work and everything that goes into it and I'm like you mentioned before like I'm sure our listeners would be very excited to hear that it's a possibility you know because a lot of times you hear that oh no that's impossible but when you hear it's a possibility it like sparks the opportunities to come up Mm -hmm. to for other people just maybe listening so i'm really excited to see what happens hopefully here (laughs) and i think translating like you know any text or even like manga or whatever you want to do reading trying it out is like the best way to learn Japanese. You know what I mean? Just try translating Mm. Japanese 
into English, like on your own, because that's like the best way to understand how Japanese language work, how it's constructed. You know, so uh-huh. I really recommend doing that because like you speak English, right? And you're learning Japanese, but you, you, you know how to speak and write in English. So try your hand at translating. It's, it's the best way to learn, I think. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> And I guess、um, lately we've been talking a lot about written translation here, where previously we we're talking a bit more about oral translation.、Mm-hmm. So I guess for you personally, Marie, which one would you say you prefer more, oral or written?、Uh, well, I think right now my focus is on written translation and writing in general.、Um, it, it's my first love, so I, I'm gravitating towards that these days. But there's You know, nothing beats the thrill and pressure of spoken <laughs> interpretation. <laughs> yeah, and like being told live that you're doing it wrong. <laughs> <So> . But if it, with translation, like you definitely have more time to craft your art and yeah. I see. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe one time I'll, I'll go try it out just to get booed off stage. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you'll never make the same mistake again because you're just like, oh my God, what did I do? You know? <laughs> <laughs>、uh, my one and only live translation. My mistake was going up on stage. <laughs>、oh, I'm, <laughs> I'm sure you'll be great. Yeah. yeah um, so. Um, So, like in, in other interviews that you've been on, you've、mm-hmm. mentioned that it was kind of hard for you to feel at home in like either Japan or the United States. So, I guess like today, like what would you say your relationship with both of those countries is?、Um, you know, I think I, when I was younger, I felt very frustrated that I couldn't relate to like completely feel at home in either countries. But <laughs> nowadays,、mm-hmm. like I think it's more it's natural to feel that way. You know, and、right. it, it's just, I think it's, it's, if you're lucky, you'll find like a person that you, or, you know, your friends you feel most at home with. And it doesn't really matter where they're from or what culture、um, they're from. So,、mm-hmm. yeah, I have, I'm lucky to have friends and family in, bo- in both countries that I feel comfortable with. Do you still like move back and forth between the US and Japan? I do. I do because I'm based here,、um, but my family is in Japan. So, I mean, it's gotten a lot difficult with COVID, but yeah. But I, I try to go back as often as possible and for my work as well. So, <laughs> for, for your work,、um, so you have work that you're doing in Japan as well right now?、Um, right now? Well, I'm translating a Japanese book. So that sort of, so,、uh, and, and the author is Japanese and she's、uh, yeah. still very much, you know, active in Japan and she's a very influential figure. So, yeah, I, I, I love getting to have that connection to my home country. <laughs> I see. So, when, when you're translating a book, and is there a lot of communication between you and the author when kind of going for the translation, or is it like a one sided process? I, I actually always wondered that in terms of, because. You、yeah. always just see translations happen, and you, you don't really get too much context behind that. Yeah, that, that's the thing.、Um, this is kind of a new experience for me because I'm so used to、um, being an interpreter where I have like, direct access to the artist, but this time, no, not none whatsoever. <laughs> just,、right. just, just with her publisher、um, alone in Japan. So, yeah, no, no access to the author herself. <laughs> but, but, oh, wow. Yeah. But I'm sure it depends on the project. Sometimes you, I'm sure some translators can get access to the author and work together. And that, might, that, that must be fascinating as well. Yeah. So, pretty recently, you worked with your husband to write an Asian American superhero <laughs> short film called Ling, right? Yeah. So, it's now being produced for a TV adapt- adaptation. So, what inspired you to go out and write a film? Yeah.、Um, Well, my husband、um, created this show called Raising Dion for Netflix. And so he's always been a f- director and a filmmaker. And throughout the years, like, I just started writing with him occasionally because、um, I studied film as well and I've always liked to write. So it just naturally happened. And we kind of wanted to. My, my husband, Dennis, he likes to、um, give voices to like, diverse characters that you don't always see on American television. So 
um, it was kind of like a follow up to what he's been doing. Um, yeah. And Ling, this, uh, this TV show, hopefully, um, it kind of mixes like 2D anime as well. So <laughs> it kind of is influenced by what I grew up watching in Japan, like Sailor Moon and like Sally the Witch. And so kind of old school Japanese TV anime animated. Yeah. So we'll see how it goes. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I'm sure our listeners would be very excited to <laughs> go and check it out. Yeah, <laughs> they do. <laughs> yep. And I guess um, so this is kind of, uh, of course, this is different from interpretation, but did you find that any of your skills from your from interpretation and translation really, oh. like, helped you in when you are making, when you are writing this? Yeah, because I think, you know, translation and interpretation, like, we, it's, they both deal with words and I think translation especially helps you understand the craft of writing fiction and it just slows down the process more of like you, you kind of break down what goes into like a fictional piece and when you're translating. So yeah, I think it definitely helped me um, in a sense. Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> and I guess like in wow. the, in the future, do you want to continue working on translation or maybe fo- focus on writing? Um, well, interpretation and translation will always be part of my life. It's like a never ending project for me. I'm always learning But um, I think over the years, I think my focus has shifted a little more to writing. Um, mm. I don't know when I would feel entirely comfortable saying I'm like definitely a translator or writer, but it, uh-huh. but at the same time, I'm kind of like, jump in with both feet and see what happens kind of person. So <laughs> um, it's, it's something that I, I, I want to get better at. Definitely. Yeah. Mm. I mean, it's, it's gotten you so far already, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm really excited to see how it goes. Um, so I, I, I guess for um, pe- people listening right now who are interested in, and translation. So you've mentioned of all your mentors that have gone and given you advice through the years. So mm-hmm. if you were to go and give a piece of advice to the listeners today, what would, what should, what would you say to them? Yeah, I would, you know, tell them to read everything in both languages and keep a notebook of all your mistakes, own your mistakes and, and learn from them. And, you know, say, say yes to all the experiences that comes your way in the beginning and connect with your local organization, companies, anyone who might be looking for an interpreter. It might have to start with something small, like you're just translating emails or, you know, Zoom calls, but it's totally fine to mm-hmm. start small. It's interpretation is interpretation. So, yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> we need more interpreters and translators in the world, I think. So. Yeah. yeah, hopefully we get a, a wave of Korekara um, interpreters here. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> can raise an army here. <laughs> totally. Also, I guess like um, knowing that you read a lot, do you have any like book recommendations of maybe Japanese books or even like translations that um, are good? Well, I'm like going to do something really gross and self-promote here, but... <laughs> I, I um, wrote a novella, like a short novel about a young American translator who one day receives a letter from the author of the book she translates that her translation sucks. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> this in- inspires her to go to meet the author in person for the first time in Japan. So, and I, I hope to um, make that available through my website soon. So <laughs> that's what I recommend. <laughs> <laughs> Does that I can't count? Wait to read it. Yeah, <laughs> that, 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 that definitely <laughs> counts. <to> it. Sorry. <laughs> I mean, do you have do you have um any anything else you want the listeners to know about too? Um, no. I mean, I I'm just like so excited that so many people are learning Japanese or any other languages, and you know, I have so much respect for self learners and everything. So just, just keep doing what you're doing. It's incredible. Yeah. Great. I mean, I, I think that's a, a great note to yeah. close the podcast off here for today. Marie, thank you so much for coming thank on. You. It's been an absolute treat 
It oh, is, is something that we've really been looking forward to and really getting the opportunity to talk to you has been really amazing for us. Oh, it was my honor. Thank you so much, guys. This was like, it was a great time. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's been a great time for us, too. And usually right at the end, we do our little message to the Korekara listeners. Could be anything, any fun little tidbit here. So, Marie, what is your message to the Korekara listeners today? Um, translate more. Interpret more. <laughs> Just don't feel like you need permission. Go and do it. <laughs> and <laughs> if, you know, we find if we ever become audience for each other, We'll try to be kind and like not yell out that if you're doing it wrong. <laughs> Positivity. <Yes>. Positivity. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Cool. Ho- hopefully you'll go teach us how to fold some clothes too. Oh, uh, that's it. That I can do. <laughs> <laughs> Looking forward to it. Okay. All right. We'll sign off here. Thank you for okay. listening, everyone. Thank you. Hey guys, thanks for listening to our podcast. Just want to quickly shout out our patrons, Sad Boy, Izenga71, Light, KH90, Jack, Drew, and Miku. And if you want to support us, we have bonus clips of almost every episode on Patreon. And see you guys in the next episode. Peace.